slowly shifting gears back now to let's put our serious hats on and uh, with covid-19 affecting and increasing volatility in markets all across the world investing and trading can be a tricky business right now it sure is for me but according to someone now is not the worst time to invest someone is always saying now is not the worst time to invest so here is inviting the man who is all about markets nitid kamath of virodha on everything you need to know about investing and trading and running a startup during covid-19 from being bootstrapped to now running a billion dollar business nitin kamat founder and ceo of virodha has been seen following the growth at any cost approach by focusing on building a sustainable business model backed by a solid tech product sort of like bandar wala shashank kumar uh, co-founder and ceo cto of raise pay apologies is all set to ask some tough questions and give us some relevant insights that will help businesses like you so without further ado Let me call Nitin and Shashank on stage. Thanks, Khan. Hey, Nitin, hi. Welcome to the Fireside Chat. Hello, everyone. Uh, Thanks. Thanks today so we are going to hear from the CEO of Zeroda, Nitin Kamath, one of the youngest self-made billionaires in the country. <laughs> and Nitin bootstrapped Zeroda about ten years ago and has grown it to it being the largest trading firm today, doing more than fifteen percent of the trading volume nationally and having three point five million plus customers. Then that's been an amazing journey in past ten years. you know i i want to ask how did the idea of zeroda came about how did you actually started the company uh, back in the days yeah I, i used to trade the markets you know from when i was really young uh, so and i started trading the market in the late 90s uh, then uh, i traded almost for 12 years before zeroda happened so you know to be very honest zeroda is not a 10 year journey it's i actually started the day i started trading the markets so maybe it's like a 22 23 year old journey so uh and uh, the reason for starting zeroda back in 2010 was uh, me and my younger brother we were very active traders and uh you know i i was also a sub broker a franchisee of a larger brokerage firm and uh and we kind of saw no point in paying high amounts of brokerage when we were not using their relationship manager their research reports and all of that So when we started the business, it was essentially uh, trying to build a low-cost, transparent kind of a broker for very active day traders, which is an options traders. Uh, it kind of has evolved quite a bit from then, right? As in, uh, I mean, today uh, we have something else altogether. But that was essentially the genesis uh, of starting the business. You know, uh, what I what I see is that I mean, you have been in the trading business for a very long time, right? And and you deeply understand the domain. Uh, it's actually quite opposite to how we we started raise pay i mean, we didn't we didn't have any understanding about the payments domain as this uh, you know and we kind of dive right in when we uh, when we saw that you know we experienced the pay, pain point around payments ourselves and we felt like there's a gap in the market but actually the, the key thing that worked for us that we were selling to people you know who were uh, who were like young entrepreneurs or tech uh, technologists or product folks and experienced the pain point uh, i guess what is relevant is that i mean while there are different ways to start a business at least you know you should understand the problem really well it's even better like if you have faced the problem yourself uh and have some insights into into the industry then uh then it kind of gives you an edge uh in a way especially in fintech i mean a lot of firms which are starting a lot of companies which are operating you know are operating in a heavily regulated market and you have grown the business uh, tremendously uh while dealing with so much regulations in the industry right how has been your experience and you know how do you see the regulatory landscape changing uh, and helping businesses compared to how it was uh, you know a decade ago no i mean i think uh, uh, i think in this business you now especially you know in a business where you're doing client retail client facing things uh, you know essentially being a bank or a broker right? because as a as a as an nbfc today you lend money right as in when you're lending money uh you know the regulator doesn't care about you as much right but when you are the custodian of customer assets uh you know regulators care uh, quite a bit about how you run the business you know and and all of that right so uh because after the banks i think brokers are the the only real custodians of sorts um, uh you know of client assets so for example i think our customers today hold more than 50 55000 crores of stocks with us right as in so uh so yeah so that that comes with its own responsibilities uh, so i think in this business it's very important to almost have like a regulatory foresight 
uh, like the way you know you kind of think of your business saying you know what can potentially change in the future i think it's very important to uh, you know wire your business for any regulatory changes that can potentially happen right um, and uh, uh, so even even back in 2010 when we started zeroda one of the uh, enablers of starting the business was uh, sebi introduced this concept of a short margin penalty right i mean for people who don't trade the markets essentially what it means is that uh, Uh, see, ninety, ninety, over ninety percent of all trading in the stock markets are leveraged trades, right? Which is a person with one one rupee is buying five rupees of worth of stuff uh, and and holding the position overnight, right? Uh, so until until two thousand eight, there was no minimum amount required to be held overnight. So for example, today if you're you know kind of uh, an NBFC, you know there is uh, capital adequacy ratios and stuff like that, right? It is almost very similar to that. Uh, and uh, and there is no way we could have disrupted on pricing by giving taking extreme amounts of risk right uh, so so back in 2008 after the financial crisis sebi came in and reduced the kind of risks broker can take right and that's when we as a business came into play right and and through the last 10 years uh, every single regulation has actually favored online transparent you know client first kind of facing brokers right uh, i mean over the last 2 3 years especially there have been a bunch of episodes where large brokers have had issues so sebi has been on a you know has been you know changing like a, a bunch of regulations really quickly but each of those regulation has kind of helped us as a business because we were already wired for these changes i mean i didn't know that it'll happen in 2010 in 2019 or 2020 but we knew that it's going to happen sometime in the future and the way we were building the business was saying you know what regulations has to get you know get you know kind of you know get changed here it has to get adjusted because this is something that can be misused right and uh, and every time a, ch- a change has happened we have actually you know built some distance on the competition because we were ready faster than everyone else uh, at that point uh, and i think the biggest thing that has helped in this whole journey for us is the you know is just this aadhar being allowed for onboarding right because until 2016 uh, an account opening at zeroda would take you like a 40 page document 40 signatures and you know a lot of courier to and fro right uh, and uh, once aadhar was allowed to be used for uh, kyc and e-sign it became like a 15 minute process right? just to give you an example uh, until demonetize i mean until sorry until aadhar onboarding we were at around 1 lakh customers uh, we are today at almost 40 lakh customers right so we you know it took us you know almost like 6 years to grow to the first lakh and then within the remaining 39 lakhs in like you know for years time so so yeah so uh, i think i think regulation is you know is going to help uh, you know online first you know where you know uh, where you know building a transparent kind of a business model uh, i think that's going to help uh, in the regulated space at least the forex growth actually is incredible uh, you know i even have to credit the policy makers that uh we have been seeing a lot of regulations happening in the past few years which are extremely friendly to uh businesses and also favorable to the customers as well right and uh, i think even uh, even uh, you know things like demonetization and then uh, post that uh, you know the whole upi changes that have happened i think favored a lot of firms uh you know meet uh, even in the fintech space even in the payment space i saw like you know i mean we have seen like a renaissance of payments and a lot of new consumers coming into the fintech ecosystem uh i think uh, you know a lot of entrepreneurs even today can truly hope that the upcoming policy changes in the in the coming years uh, will be favorable for the fintech ecosystem uh, that is out there and and if you have a foresight that you know uh, what those changes could be then you could be in, in a significant position to take advantage of it yeah no i mean i think i think i i speak to, and i sit on a bunch of committee i speak i mean i think generally you know the government is focused on financialization right uh, and which means you know I think I think it's going to help fintech companies quite a bit so it's uh, over the next few years for for sure there's no doubt about it so uh you know a lot of a lot of fintech uh, firms which are starting up and that you know are uh, going to compete against uh, established incumbents of uh, and legacy businesses uh, that are there right and you have done a great job of it uh, in the past decade right uh, what are what are things that have worked great for you and you know how do you keep uh, and now that you have become an incumbent right how do you <laughs> uh the whole <laughs> yeah no no i mean i like i know one of those things i keep telling everyone in our team is that there is no status quo today you know i, I mean there is someone waiting to disrupt us so it's it's important that we get up every morning and and say you know what can we do more right uh, i think i think uh, uh 
some of the things that we have done right in this journey is is that uh, we've, we've not shifted focus. And, uh, you know, there have been a lot of distractions that have come along the way uh, to do other things. You know, and and you know, I mean, our focus right from day one has been to offer a great trading platform for our customers, right? And and we've done whatever it takes to make that happen, right? I mean, I haven't gone sold random third party products. I haven't, you know, I haven't gotten into giving away, say, personal loans and stuff because you know that's not a, that's not even my core competency, right? As in. Uh, so we've stuck around doing what we think is core competency, uh, you know, where you know the team understands the business well, uh, and we said, uh, you know, this is where we have a an edge over our competition, right? As in, there is a lot of experience from before Zeroda. Um, two, I think uh, we got an extremely lucky finding. I think Kalash is on the next panel, you know. So you know, so finding Kalash and you know our tech team, you know, who who build like a great product. And I think one of the things that I've done right there is that, as you know, I've, I've made sure no one from business interferes with tech, right? Because uh, you know, <laughs> it, 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 otherwise I've seen it, that that thing go wrong, right? As in, um, so uh, so yeah, so uh, that's helped quite a bit. Three years, I mean, which is actually the maybe the first most important reason why we've done okay is, is because we always have kept customer first, so in mind, uh, and it's helped. Because we are bootstrapped, so we have never really chased revenue growth as a business. You know, it's always been you get up every day and do something that can help the customer do better. And all the revenue growth considerations have always been secondary. And I mean, that's never you know come in between while deciding what to build for the customer. Um, you know, just to give you an example, like this year, you know, one of the one of the things I'm most excited about is is this platform called Nudge that we have built where uh, we tell a person who's trading investing in the market when he's doing a mistake that he's doing a mistake right now the thing about nudge is that no nudge will ever ask the customer to trade more it'll always ask the customer to trade less in the sense you know like for example uh, this year you know we built this thing where if someone is buying a penny stock at zero the uh, we tell the person you know we kind of almost scare the shit out of the person saying you know you shouldn't be uh, trading penny stocks it can lose all the money uh, and our penny stock trading volumes have dropped significantly, and you know I'm so so excited that you know we are helping our customers by avoiding them, you know, making these mistakes, right? But but the thing here is that the penny stock trading volumes have dipped significantly, which is you know we've let go of a lot of revenue to help the customer, right? And uh, and I think in today's online world, in a in a world where people are connected socially, uh, when you do what is right for the customer, the word of mouth kicks in quite fast, uh, you know. So like for example, until late. We haven't spent a single rupee on advertisement um, or marketing or any of that, right? As in, we have never done a Google ad word or a Facebook ad or anything like that. I mean, uh, I think the only time was, you know, someone gave us free credits to go do advertisements for like 15, 20,000 rupees. I mean, uh, and we tried to do brand key advertisement and see if keyword advertisement to see if, you know, uh, if it makes any sense. It didn't. And we stopped doing it. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I think, I think today uh, what people don't understand is this whole power of, uh, you know, of uh, you know this this network effects that that kind of kicks in, especially in the B two C kind of a business. You know, if you if you're constantly doing what is right for the customer, I think I think uh, a lot of things happen automatically. You know, you don't really have to go chasing uh, and spending too much money to acquire a customer. That's it. so. I even remember that you know when Zerda started, and there was uh, it actually brought a lot of transparency to the business, right? There's no hidden fees, and there's uh, uh, you know nothing that you need to be afraid of, right? And and beyond a point, like even for retail traders, there's no fees for transactions as well, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and today I see that there's a very, very strong community around Zerda as well, uh, and and I've heard like how you know uh, you have talked a lot around like uh, how you have participate in different WhatsApp groups, different blogs uh, that you folks are writing uh, to kind of make people aware. Uh, for some of these things, like, you know, you talked about, do you, do you think that it will move, for example, let's say penny, uh, you know, penny stock trading to some other platform, right? Do you see that kind of happening uh, for your business? Yeah, no, I mean, it, it, it is, the risk is always there, right? As in, if, if we are not allowing someone to trade on a certain stock, he might just go and trade on some other platform, right? So, so what we've done is uh, with Nudge is we allow people to override those rules, right? As in, we can't block out customers. Uh, but the next thing that we're building is uh, is this feature where every time a, a person overrides a Nudge, we actually capture it as a PNL, right? As in, to show it to him, saying, you know what, you you kind of broke. The thing is, 
at the end of the day, right, I think trading is very similar to building a business. Uh, you know, the, the rules required to win when trading and running a business is almost very similar, right? Uh, you know, just to say, I give you a few rules, uh, things like, you know, don't go against a trend. If you want to experiment, do it with small amounts of money. If, uh, you know, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Right? I mean, these are all very, you know, very core to how, you know, when you build a business as well. Right? I mean, these are things uh, you need to keep in mind. Uh, so what this whole platform that we're building is essentially, you know, it reminds a person every time he's breaking these basic rules. I think one of the big problems with traders and, uh, you know, entrepreneurs is uh, I think we are always chasing for that, you know, we're always searching for that holy grail, right? This whole magical portion that suddenly makes us a lot of money, right? And and there's nothing like that, right? Unfortunately, right? As in, it's just, uh, it's, uh, you know, it's just a chase as in, uh, I think, I think what, what I think all of us should do as traders or entrepreneurs is, uh, is, is, you know, is follow those basic rules that are required to, you know, which improves your odds of winning significantly. And then just be at it, you know I mean? Like a lot of people today almost make me seem like I'm an overnight success. It's not, I mean, I've, I've slogged 23 years of my life and, and the last two, three years of this has been, you know, better you know, and, and that's when, you know, people are noticing, right? As in, um, so it takes time, you, you know, you need that right place, right time. You know, you know, goddess of luck to smile on you as well, right? So I think I think the whole strategy has to be, uh, you know, do your, follow your four or five things that you're supposed to follow well, and uh, and hope that luck hits you sometime. You know, so do do you still actively trade? No, I I've stopped. You know, my younger brother does. Uh, you know, so Nikhil, uh, like I said, right when we started Zeroda, the bet was that uh, I mean the the fallback was that. If Zeroda didn't fly in, in one year, I'll go back to trading. Uh, uh, but you know, the idea was he continues trading. Uh, and and one of the reasons I think uh, we we were able to bootstrap this, especially in the first one two years, was because because of Nikhil's trading, and because his trading. You know, I mean, uh, so we you know when we started the business, we had like 20, 25 lakh rupees left, and um, and Nikhil was supposed to use that money, make some money, so we can run our business you know, until business becomes profitable, which he did, and that's how we survived. You know, so. That's amazing. I have always wondered. So you know, there's a lot of uh, research around the psychology of trading, right? And how uh, traders think about the various ups and downs of the market. You know, what lessons would you say, like from that industry, are really applicable for businesses and startups uh, in the country, right? And what do you, uh, how do you think, you know, your trading background has actually helped you uh, in running the business? No, I think. See, the thing is, okay. So let me pull some of those things, which kind of. A very common between traders and people running businesses, right? I think I think the big problem with a lot of people, you know, humans in general, is that we like to throw good money at bad money. In the sense, if something goes wrong, uh, you know, we don't like to accept that it's gone wrong for a reason, right? And you try to make the wrong right, right? And the best strategy in life is when something goes wrong, accept that it's wrong and move on in your life, right? As in, and not try to make it right. And uh, so, you know, when you're trading, you call it a stop loss, right? As in, so if uh, you buy a stock at say 400 rupees. If you know if it falls to 350, you don't try to buy more stock, more of that stock, trying to reduce your average cost, right? I mean, uh, like just to give you an example, in uh, last year, the most held stock at Zeroda was Yes Bank, the worst performing stock of the year, right? And and just people just went mental, you know. Every time it fell, more people came and bought the stock, right? And uh, you know, I mean, this whole idea of nudge came in around that same time, saying that you know we need to do something to stop people from. At least, you know, create some awareness saying, you know what, buying averaging down is probably the worst strategy in life, right? Which is when something goes down, you know, you, you try to buy more of it just to make it, you know, reduce your overall cost. So now, you know, you're thinking just if it moves a little up, I'll somehow recover all my effort in my life. So I think even for businesses, you know, people who run businesses, you know, if an idea is wrong, accept it and go to the next idea, right? I mean, you don't want to waste your time and money and effort, uh, you know, and trying to make a wrong idea right, you know, so, uh, you know, unfortunately, not all ideas work, you know, I mean, if all ideas worked, you know, life would be, you know, like, uh, it'll be like some some other planet, I don't think on planet Earth, it works, right. So, so I think, I think for people who are doing starting a business, the idea is the same, you, you give a shot at something, if it is not working, say, you know, you give it some time, you have a time stop loss, say one year, two years, at the end of one, two years, you know, sit back and be honest to yourself and not let ego involve uh, and say, dude, did this make sense? You know, should I put more time and effort in this? Uh, if, you know, if it doesn't make sense, move on and do something else in life, you know, because otherwise I've just seen so many founders just slogging out for years and years, you know, when 
when you actually sit back, you know, you, you know that maybe in the first one year itself, you would have figured out that this was not an idea where you should have put more time. Right. And, and the thing about, I think, uh, you know, in a business is that you also miss out on this opportunity cost. Right. So when you're in a bad trade, right, you don't, t- you know, you don't look at other opportunities in life. Right. And, and that's, that's a problem with, uh, you know, with stock markets as well. You know, you know I've uh, spoken about this before. It's called a disposition bias where all, all, you know, all you're doing is essentially you're trying to make that right, a bad decision, right. By selling your winners, you know, all your, you know, like this, this is very common again in the market, right? If, if a person has say two stocks, one is making money and one is losing money, people sell what is making money and buy more of what is losing money, right? That's because they don't want to accept that they were wrong, you know? And, um, and then now, you know, you're just so stuck into this one stock or one, two stocks, which is losing money that you're, you're actually missing out on all the other opportunities. The right trade for that person was to, you know, exit the one that is losing and buy more of what is winning, you know, because in your life, uh, you need to be with things that are trending up, right? I mean, that's another, I think it's, it's probably another really important rule of trading that you need to follow in business as well, right? As in, um, you know, trying to call what will somehow reverse a direction, you know, in terms of trend is, is stupid. I mean, if you're building a business, build for something which an idea that's trending up, you know, where the opportunities are going to be more over time and, and the odds of you winning increases uh, significant. I'm, I'm not saying that going against a trend is wrong, but the problem with going against a trend is that you don't know how long before the trend reverses, right? As in, you know, you like for example, if you bought the stock, at, you know, Yes Bank at 350, thinking it was at 400, so it's come to 350. You know, it's a good price because it's come down. You know, it came all the way down to 10 rupees, right? As in, you you potentially are stuck in a in a in a wrong trend for a long period of time. So, uh, so I think, yeah, I think these are some of the things. Uh, you know, that maybe that I've learned when I'm trading. Uh, and also, I think I think to uh, into stock chasing, you know, like one of my, I think I blew up in 2001. Uh, uh, and I when I blew up, I borrowed a lot of money and I blew up trading. So I went, worked in a call center for three, four years. And I think my most biggest life lessons were <laughs> during those really tough times of my life. And uh, one of the things I realized uh, then I think which helped me significantly was to stop chasing money, you know, as in this whole chasing revenue growth, etc. Right? As in, uh, it just kind of uh, distracts you from what you're really supposed to do, right? As in, you end up trying to, you know, do a bunch of things to chase this, whereas money is really a byproduct, you know. I mean, you can't really chase it down, you know. So, uh, uh, I mean, it sounds, you know, like almost like a Yani types, but 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 it's actually quite you know uh, I can tell you with experience that uh, the biggest reasons for traders to lose money is they focus too much on revenue. I mean too much on profits, right. and you know this amount of profits. You know, I, so. I think I think that is very relevant, right? I mean you know uh, for for the biggest uh, best companies in the world, right? I think focus is always solving on some customer problem, and you know revenue and profits is is a good byproduct of it instead of just optimizing for. Uh, revenue and profits that is there, right? And and it's interesting, like you know what you mentioned about the disposition effect. Uh, uh, so you know, I I know about this prospect theory by uh, Daniel Kahneman, right? Which talks about that. I mean, just losing thousand dollars, right? I mean, psychologically, it's probably equivalent to how you would feel if you actually gain, let's say, two thousand five hundred or three thousand dollars, right? Mm-hmm. So so while economic value is equivalent, but you know, I mean, psychological value is extremely uh, different. That is there, right? And I think that's why, I mean, you know, uh, when uh, we do a lot more to probably prevent losses than to actually uh, do something significant to, you know, uh, gain on the upside uh, that is there. Uh, okay, anyways, but, you know, shifting gears, right? Uh, how do you see, like, the broader uh, trading ecosystem will evolve in next few years? So, I mean, if I have to summarize, right, in last 10 years, like, few innovative things I've seen happening, I mean, your discount broking has truly gone, gone mainstream, right? And the overall fees for transactions have come down. Uh, then beyond that, you know, I mean, we are seeing a lot n- new uh, startups coming in, and you know, uh, PTM Money and the others taking trading truly to the uh, tier two uh, markets. That is there, right? So in next five years, in next ten years, how do you see like the Indian ecosystem will look like in terms of trading, and what new innovations uh, can actually come in? Yeah, no. See, the thing is, uh, see, pricing is not really the reason where we are today, right? I think, I think, I think the reason we are today whatever as a leading broker is because of the product i mean the platform this whole ecosystem we created with rain matter you know like almost like this bunch of startups were on top of us 
and also all our education initiatives right i mean i think that was you know if i had to put it in terms of priority i mean these are actually you know more important reason than the pricing itself pricing gave us a little bit of edge in the start the first 3 4 years but pricing today isn't really there i mean if you look at it today there is no more discount broker no more low yeah. i mean i mean because even icsci hdfc have dropped their prices to where we are at you know so uh, so pricing isn't really a, is a thing but um, uh, but i think you know the, the issue is like looking back over the last 10 years i think the problem i mean i have is that you know maybe this was this isn't ha- be, you know, this hasn't been enough you know i mean we aren't today helping um so today we take this stance saying you know we are a platform people come can come buy and sell whatever they want right but the problem i have with this is that you no know, one of those things that keeps me up in the night is that there are customers coming and doing mistakes on our platform right i mean while we are doing it good as a business is is it even i mean is it okay for me to be okay you know letting our customers do mistake right and that's that's that, that was essentially the reason not the platform got uh, evolved i mean the, it was born but i think the yeah the yeah, problem just to come to point to that right i mean uh, in us you have seen like robinhood as a platform coming up right and 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 what we really hear about them that you know they have gamified trading to the extent that you know the new millennial generation can just uh, go into trading and it actually feels like a game to an extent uh, in terms of investing like you know it's literally one click investing and you know taking money out and then uh, some sort of uh, things around you know when you make profits and all that right mm-hmm. so uh, uh, while on the other hand you know you are talking about like you know how do we educate uh customers to to help them prevent uh making losses right when in some sense like i think that's that's the nature of the of the uh, of this thing as well right uh so how do you, how do you, do you think like you know something like robin hood also will kind of happen in india uh mm-hmm. you know or or how would we we actually bring in like new traders or new people uh growing up into the ecosystem uh, in, and in the markets yeah no i mean the thing is uh, i mean like the debate really is do you want to sell guns to everyone right uh you know so i mean it's a, it's a tough one you know i am actually on the other side right i mean i'm potentially selling the guns today right so uh, uh it's a you know is that's that like i said i don't know if we should get everyone to come trade the markets very easily right i mean i actually think the way to uh, introduce market should be through an advisor or you know the problem i think what's missing in india is an advisory ecosystem um and i don't think anyone solved for it yet you know i mean that's something that we would want to do at some point of time as in we still don't know how uh, today you know thankfully at least uh, the sebi has put a framework in terms of you know what a advisor how it looks etc uh, but what the challenge today is that uh, advisors find it extremely tough to collect fees from their customers like you know you don't want to pay an advisory fee right as a, as a user yeah uh, people don't appreciate advice so i think i think uh, you know if you get people to come play stock market as a game they're going to be there for a few days and they're going to disappear right because as soon as you make some losses you're not going to come around you know i mean yeah this year is just you know there's it's just a bubble you know i mean so people are you know very active in the market but it's not going to continue like this there you know in india there are only 5 crore indians who pay income tax i mean who filed income tax returns so it's not that you have access to unlimited amounts of people right as in so i think the the i think what the platform should do is find ways to keep your customers profitable and and that's a chase really you know i mean what can we do to help our customers be in the money and you're going to try making it a game of course you can go value yourself whatever list on exchange make a bunch of money but if that is a chase you know that's a chase right as in uh, uh, so um, so for us it's 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 always been that as in i mean we thought we can educate a lot of customers so varsity today for example is maybe the second third largest education initiative in the world but we have realized that people today don't even have the you know with all this distraction around us with the mobile and all of that you know people don't even have i think bandwidth to sit and learn right since so now you know it's almost like we are saying maybe you should leverage technology and get the platform itself kind of nudge people to do the right things right so uh, yeah the challenge for our broking business or people trying to build products around savings and investing is that india is a poor country right i mean we we have less than 2 crore indians who are filing any kind of income taxes so now if people don't have money how will they invest to save right i mean of course there will be people wanting to borrow money i mean there, that's a big market but people who have money and uh, wanting to save that market is a really tiny market today and you don't want them you know the small market to be having you know learning bad things right as in uh, you know you don't want to because you know if, if people come to stock market thinking it's a game they're going to blow out i mean i can i can take a bet on it i mean right so you don't want the small audience to all you know become more even, even more shallow or of sort so uh so yeah so i think i think the problem to solve in this country is to help customer do better with his savings and investments 
and i think maybe equities is not even the right product i mean it might sound you know conflicting you know coming from a stock broker but i think i think the right product for india is probably fixed income you know i mean uh, corporate bonds and etc so you are taking lesser risk than equities uh, but you know you are also still uh, getting higher returns than your bank fixed deposits and maybe the right stepping stone is you know introduce people to fixed income and and this is something that we are you know actively pursuing partnering with startups etc to uh, you know to solve the problem this way <laughs> i oh, i want one comment from you you know we are seeing again like bitcoin uh, skyrocketing right and reaching $25000 and there's a lot of uh, clamor around like you know uh, when will we see uh, you know uh, activity around uh, bitcoin being allowed in the country uh, per se right uh, what are, what are your thoughts uh, on that no man I, i've tried to understand what bitcoin is and never been able to understand so i have almost zero exposure to bitcoin i mean uh, i see the thing is, this year is just I want to be like you know some sort of crypto trading on coming on to zarada no i mean as long you know unless sebi puts it on uh, on, on a circular saying you know what brokers can allow it i mean i don't think i don't think that's happening anytime soon so so unless that happens uh, i don't think we'll ever allow crypto trading right but um, but yeah but generally i think I, i don't even know what's happening to asset prices this year i mean i mean this year has just been like everything has been ridiculous right as in i look at stock markets i'm like dude why are indices there you know then i look at bitcoin it's a 25 almost i mean like what just happened right i mean yeah so i don't really have any answers to any of these questions even after having 20 25 years of experience trying to speculate and trade the markets you know, so. <laughs> no actually uh, you know, that's that's really amazing and you know i i find that like i mean uh, unlike most entrepreneurs right i mean you know you are completely on the opposite end uh, in terms of advocating for uh, like you know what's uh, from your heart that you think that's like, really good for the customer right even if it is not uh, amazing for the business uh, but how do you see like i mean you know you talked about financial literacy and you know you're seeing like uh, zero the varsity uh, and the good work that is doing right uh, in a way i think it's it's responsibility of the fintech ecosystem uh, to kind of see how they can evangelize financial literacy right and spread that uh, in the country way more than what is probably happening today and uh, I, yeah i think i think uh, we as an ecosystem should probably be doing much more uh, around that absolutely i mean see the i think the only hope for india is educate people of this country right and educate as many people of this country and and education is really the only way i think we're going to become a more powerful country and uh, and, we, and i think one of the things that we are trying to do with varsity now is to go younger so we are we are you know we are i think we're planning for a like a quiz uh, like a national uh, financial literacy quiz for kids uh, you know i think 11 8 to 12 standard kids and etc because i think what what typically happens is with these habits right you form uh these habits very easily uh, and then it's very tough to break them you know so typically right when you uh, come out of college you find your first job you end up picking habits so you know saving and investing habits from people around you or your parents or whatever right so uh and and it's very tough to break that once you build that habit um so and, i think yeah. really, i mean you know like financial literacy in a way is not not part of our curriculum anyways <laughs> while that's probably one of the biggest skills that people need uh in real life I'll I'll quickly close. You know, I think we have probably time for taking one or two questions uh, from the audience. Uh, that is there. You know, uh, yeah, I think uh, I think earlier Prashant had asked, right? Like, I mean, you know, one one thing that that is there. When will we see like uh, India becoming more algorithmic trading compared to you know uh, uh, typically people investing uh, in stocks the way it is happening today? Right? When will we see a lot more high frequency trading coming into the ecosystem? No, no, there is there is a lot of high frequency trading that happens already. Half the turnover on the stock markets today come from high frequency trading uh, desks. I think what Prashant must be asking is when will retail investors st- start going trading programmatically? Um, I think there's a there's a problem there uh, because uh, the biggest pro- you know complaints that come in the ecosystem today is uh, uh, unauthorized trading. Uh, so imagine you know you give an algo to a retail guy and it loses money, right? I mean. Uh, I don't even know if you know algo trading should be allowed for retail. Uh, you know, for people who don't know the risks of the because you know someone's gonna. The problem in India is for every uh, you know every uh, opportunity there are people trying to misuse that opportunity to do some you know, random things, right? As in you know if if retail algos are allowed in this country tomorrow morning you get up and you know you'll see advertisement saying my algo will make you hundred percent a month, right? I mean, so it's 
like I, you know i think it, i think for the regulator that's a it's a very tough challenge um, uh, you know so so yes yeah, so i i don't know if retail algos will ever be allowed uh, where when i say algos you know where automatically everything trades and suddenly some magically somehow money is made for the customer i don't think that's ever happening uh, but but generally if, if if someone is a programmer there are there are a bunch of brokers today who give api access for for them to build their own algos you know so got it. one one more one last more I, you know when we, when do you think i mean zarda will actually go public <laughs> yeah no i see the thing is uh, looking back one of the uh, the reason i can be like this right i can i can say i'm okay to let go of revenue growth and you know for customer interest is because there is no investor to answer to right as in there is no like you know like there is no investor where i have to go and continuously keep showing a revenue or, or a profit growth right so and that's really a, the big moat we have as a business where you know we can actually the organizational structure itself uh, so you know that gives us the edge over a lot of our competition in terms of how nimble we are and the kind of decisions we can take um and uh, i don't know if we should i don't know why if ever we will want to lose that nimbleness as a business right because you know as soon as you go go ipo you know you just there are a lot more compliances and you you have to answer you know you have to make your investors money right i mean today we never get up in the morning thinking of making money but if tomorrow you have investors you have to find a way for your investors to make money of their investments so i don't know if uh, we want to be obligated to that you know so maybe you know, I, i don't really see uh, an idea like that so uh, uh, th- thanks thanks a lot nitin uh, this was a very insightful session and you know and I'm, i'm sure like you busted a lot of myths uh, that the audience may have you know around entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs running trading firms specifically right i feel like you come across a lot more and someone commented as well that you know come across as a lot more as a buddhist monk you know in the trading fraternity uh and 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 i cannot imagine a better future right? i really truly truly wish the best for zeroda in the coming years ahead and and i hope you guys keep innovating in the ecosystem and keeping forward thank you thanks thanks ishan